from Houston, Texas. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube. Covering Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. Now your host, Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here. We're at the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, the best name of any tech convention we go to and probably one of the highest energy tech conventions we go to out of the 70 that we're going to cover in 2015. Really excited uh, to be joined by our next guest, our first gaming-centric guest really? that we've had on the show so far. Yeah, Brianna Wu, Head of Development for Giant Space Cat. Brianna, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm super pumped to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So games are such a big part of technology, such a big part of the growth of, of technology and development, and you are right in the middle of it. We are, we are. You know, we've seen this explosion in women gamers in the last few years. So, you know, when I was growing up in 1989, women were only 3% of the gaming audience. In 2008, women were only 17% of the gaming audience. Today, the average gamer is a 35-year-old woman. So we are actually, women are 52% of gamers now in 2015, so there's this huge explosion. And one of the most exciting things about being here at Grace Hopper is all the women that are so pumped about working in games. So they, they want to come like change the world and make an entirely new set of games for everyone. So Let's talk a little bit about the way that that's, that's changed. Because back in the early day of games, right, it was all, you know, the games are so boy-centric, they're right. so boy-centric. You know, how do we how do we have the girls have something to participate? Because right. on Christmas morning when you brought home the Atari, right, there was no cartridge. There was one for Billy, but none for Susie to oh, stick in the game. So have the yes, games yes. changed or have just women got more involved in the games? Or what's really changed to get that demographic? So what's frustrating is it's barely changed. You, know, you brought up the Nintendo Entertainment System. So when I grew up in 1985, my parents brought home my Nintendo. And you know it's just Super Mario Brothers, right? It's not Super Mario Sisters. So in 1987, they had Super Mario 2, which had Princess Peach in it. And I was so excited because I could finally play as a woman. But then it was 20 years until a poor Mario game would let you play as a woman again. So, you know, the, the truth is our industry is really failing at giving women role models. And, you know, it's turned around a bit in recent years. Like we see games like Tomb Raider. Yeah, you know, they've radically changed Tomb Raider and Lara Croft. And, you know, nowadays she is, um, she's this really, really well fleshed out person that you can relate to. So it's changing. But yeah, the truth is the game industry doesn't really understand just how many women are lined up asking to like have ourselves represented in games. And what's good, it's just, it's just fascinating, right? It's a big underserved market. And right. it seemed like before there was just attempts they couldn't get it right. Is right. it they can't get it right or there just aren't enough people trying to develop games you know, for women? Or, or do they even need to be that different? What, what makes a game uh, popular for a woman sure. that maybe um, not that it wouldn't be for a guy, but what is it about the guys' games that, that's missing that a woman would rather have? Well, I mean, you've, you, you, you say you're not really a super gamer. Like, you, you can look at games from the outside and like, you recognize that women aren't really represented the best in games. No, right, right, right. right. Yeah, well, they just like, shoot them up and, you know, well, you know Call of Duty. Out to there and, and, yeah, right, yeah. right. Um, you know, I think it's multifactorial. Uh, you know, sometimes. It's just giving women kind of a, a place to start to really develop that love of games. You know, when um, when the Nintendo came out, you know, I grew up with like this uh, six button controller, but today that six button controller has turned into a 15 button controller with dual joysticks. So you're really asking someone to like really understand a very complicated device just to play a game. When the iPhone came out, it kind of gave women gamers a ground floor to start on and to learn how to be gamers. So, you know, what you have here is, you know, women don't typically like the same kind of games men do. Now, you know, there, there are men that like story-based romance adventures and there are women that like shoot 'em ups But very generally speaking, there are differences in what our psychological motivations are. And the truth is, we're just not having these games made. I think a really big problem is the press. You know, the games press, I did a, a, a talk at GHC today, and you know, we covered the complete lack of women at several major gaming institutions. So you have men that are basically deciding what games have worth and what games get made. And when you don't have women in the equation, it's not really a, a surprise why the games kind of suck for us. Do you right, know what right, I mean? right. But, and then, and then you had the whole, like you said, the whole thing with iPhones and, the, right. and these little things. 
there's not there's not a 15 button nope. to to uh, joystick controller for these. So nope. how is this kind of form factor? And, and and two kind of the the duration of the games, right? It's right. I asked somebody like I don't I don't get sure. I don't get it. Like well, right now I'm bored. De -de -de -de. Right. Now I'm not bored. So yeah. I mean, how has has the mobile um, movement and the games and mobile right. changed the the bigger game? Well, game it's, it's like I said, it gives you a, a place to start. Um, you know, where I think it's so telling is to use my iPhone. I just use my finger, right? Like this is a controller that every human <laughs> on the planet, you know, if you have hands, I guess, understands, right? Um, but I think there's this misconception out there that women are only interested in Candy Crush. You know, women are only interested in like Pebble. You know, I, I would ask anyone out there this kind of saying, hey, women don't like hardcore games to ask themselves, what is the highest budget game we've ever made aimed at women? And the truth is you can't really think of a high budget game that's the equivalent of a Call of Duty. So. You know, we have a long way to go in making games for women. And what I'm excited about is our company is really going feet first into AR and VR. And you know, we are going to be at the very forefront of the market, developing really cutting edge, hollow death level games for you know this augmented reality and virtual reality experience. So that's going to be crazy, right? This is going to be is. wild. Um, Have you tried it yet? Can I ask? I, I, I tried a little bit. Yeah. Um, actually, a very interesting application with a company that does asset management, and you wear the Oculus Rift, and as you walk around the, the inventory yard of actually a power company, right. and you look at a transformer, it tells you that transformer wow. has an issue. Huh. Uh, then you can pull up the data, you know you need to swap it out and maintenance. So a really interesting kind of internet of things application right. tied to visually looking at inventory. So I haven't I haven't really done it on, sure. the, on the gaming but, side. Okay, so let me ask a question. You're walking around, did you feel nauseous? Because I'll make, I bet a million dollars you felt nauseous yeah. after you yeah. took it off. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah, you're not used to it, right? I mean, just like when you put glasses off. Well, like, it's, yeah, it's yeah, actually yeah. more complicated than that. So what we have is, it's an interface problem, right? So you have the dudes in our industry who are really eager to make games that are you know, more run and gun shooters. So what we found scientifically is if you can design games where the character is sitting still rather than moving around a lot, because what happens is your eyes are telling you that you're moving around, but your inner ear is telling you that you're standing mm. still, and that's what makes you feel nauseous. So this is a problem that we can solve. We just have to think about the way we're approaching it. Right. Yeah. So beyond, beyond the... Um, kind of the sexiness of the women in the game, whatever. Yeah. Talk about some of the, the, the characteristics of the game between the storytelling component, the sure. competition component, sure. you know, kind of the, the, the psychology component to keep give people just enough, you know, the, uh, the rewards, the, the, just enough on a random basis so they keep playing. What elements of those are you really focused on and are some of those more important for uh, male gamers versus female oh gamers? Oh God, that is such an insightful question. So, there are basically six, I'm, I'm about to get a little academic here, but there are six different um, axes that we've kind of located that are what are psychological motivation for people to play games. So if you're a Call of Duty player, what is going to psychologically motivate you to play games is going to be, uh, you're going to like mastering a very complex system, which is one axis, and then the other axis is competition, dominating your friends, score-based things. Um, typically speaking, I'm not saying no women like this, but very generally speaking, women rank much higher on enjoying immersion. That's a motivation. Immersion means story. It means feeling like you're part of a world. Uh, so like in Final Fantasy, there are a lot of women that really love Final Fantasy because this is a beautiful world that you feel like you're part of. Um, another thing that really gives women psychological motivation is feeling agency within a story the ability to change the world around them, the ability to make choices. So if you look like at women, we tend to really, really like these two things, um, which is why, you know, I think the killer app that no one's really developed yet is like a romance novel in VR. Like, and, and this is the technology that we're developing. I'm so excited about this, but the APIs and frameworks that we are investing tons of money to figure out like right now I'm looking you in the eye and that tells you things on like a human level about what I'm feeling emotionally 
Or if my voice is angry, that tells you things. Or if my voice is soft, that tells you things. So we are going to be developing technology that takes all these cues and changes the story based on that. It's like really exciting. This is the holodeck, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you've got so much horsepower, right? Yeah. Now you've got so much computing horsepower. Absolutely. So talk just a little bit, we're at a tech show, talk a little bit about the cloud, big data, sure. some of the big those big trends, how those are impacting the way you're developing games today and what it's going to enable you to do in the future. Sure, I think um, for VR, you know, one of the things that's very difficult is the, the consumer cost barrier for this, right? So um, for you not to get nauseous as you're doing it, I have to draw 60 frames a second in this eye and 60 frames a second in this eye. That's non-trivial as we right, say in engineering. Right. Um, so. You know, we, we, we found that cloud computing solutions are helpful for calculating light mass, which is something very expensive. Um, to me, what is really imperative is, you know, engineering is all about trade-offs and choices. So what we are concentrating on at our studio isn't running gun gameplay. It's not killing things. It's not shooting robots. We are spending all of our development costs on conversation on people and really t concentrating on that experience because you can't do everything, right? right like engineering's right. about choices. Right. And there's a lot of nuance, right? Yes. So there's probably a lot of a lot of serious horsepower that's required to drive the nuance Absolutely. That, that, that you see there. Well, you know, it's, it's a really interesting question. They've done studies, so our industry tends to love photorealism and love really complex static meshes and love really complex characters. Interesting thing though, that's not what the consumer likes. So if you're in VR, what we've actually found is consumers and particularly women respond much better to a lower poly count kind of cartoonish, um, think Sailor Moon kind of environment. So the irony is, if you can get away from this idea that games need to be Call of Duty, you know, it's less expensive to develop and it's more immersive, yeah. so, yeah. Well, and you see that in regular movies, right? Course, I mean, right. huge production movies, if there's no story, if there's no plot line, if it doesn't hold together, Absolutely. it's just exploding. I can yep. watch that on Mythbusters all yeah. day long, right? They yeah. blow stuff up. Yeah. Um, so, so, so where does it go next? As you get into this VR, you get into these immersive experience, does it become less of a game, more of an experience, more I'm going to go places and see things and right. do things? Well, I think for VR and AR, um, I think the, if you are an investor, I think the majority of the money there is not going to be in the game industry. Um, I have friends that are working on real estate solutions for AR. You were talking about a power plant example. It's easy to imagine that working with something like Google Glass or HoloLens. Um, it's going to be part of how we interface with computers in the future. I am waiting for Apple and Microsoft to figure out how you do you know, OS 10, how you do the file browser and VR. That's a very interesting computing problem. Um, I think the problem we've really got to figure out is interface. Um, now, I don't know if Oculus, which is over there, uh, they had a demo this year, Oculus Connect, that blew me away. So they figured out the controller, which is a haptic glove. So you put it on, and their controller will represent your hands in front of you. So if I move these fingers, I see them like springing in real life, and I can pick up virtual blocks and move them and put them around. So. I think where it goes from here is we've got to figure out the interface. That's really the big problem. Yeah, you know, we had touch screens for years, but it wasn't until Apple figured out pinch to zoom and multi-touch and all these touch-based gestures, the interface, it really took off. So um, I think if you are you know, um, a front-end designer or an interface designer, we need our best and brightest being thrown at this problem. Yeah. So let me shift gears a little bit. Please, please, please. And how, how can we use gaming and, and the, um, the draw, the connection, the, the right. pull, right? Our kids are on them all the yeah. time to, to drive other types of behaviors. For instance, you know, the whole theme here is getting girls involved in computer science Absolutely. earlier. What's the game that you can write that they don't know it, but they're actually getting exposed to and starting to learn to love the problem solving that feels like a game, but it's actually introducing them to computer Absolutely. science. That is a great question. Um, you know, for us, 
you know, I was I was telling you a bit before we started about Gamergate and how terrible that's been this year. And you know, if your listeners don't know, viewers don't know, you know, I've basically have been the target of a hate group for most of 2014. So what I spend a lot of time thinking about is the internet, like, you know, it takes empathy from us, right? Like, we're all angry at each other on Twitter right, and right. on Facebook. It's anonymous, right? It's easy to do when it's anonymous. I think the anonymity has been oversubscribed, but it's certainly aggressive towards each other, right? So what we find we're asking ourselves is how can we develop games where empathy is a building block for that. You know, like so many of the games they reward you for shooting and killing. How do we build a game that's fun but also rewards you for relating to people in a positive way? So you know, that is why we're developing the frameworks that we want to do. I, I think it's so telling that when Captain Janeway on Star Trek, when she wants to blow off some steam, she doesn't go to the hollow deck and kill more Borg she goes and talks to Leonardo da Vinci and interacts with him and learns things about herself. So to me, I think you know, the iPhone makes this very natural because we're touching something. This is a human interaction that makes sense to us. To me, the next frontier is emotional interaction. So to interact with games in a way that makes sense, to look at them, to talk to them, to have your voice reflect what you're feeling and have those systems give you feedback. So so at what point is it no longer a game? Yeah. Whatever a game means. And it just becomes an immersive experience in whatever you're choosing to right. do. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it matters, right? <laughs> right. Like, yeah, yeah. So the other just fascinating thing yeah. about game, again, I'm not a big gamer looking at it from the outside, yeah. is, is spectating. And gaming yeah. as a spectator sport oh, and yeah. these stadiums that are filled with tens of thousands of people watching other people play games. Right. What is that all about? Well, it's, you know, it's a, are you a sports fan? Are you a sports fan? Yeah, absolutely. Fan? It's exactly the same thing. Like, um, you know, there is a game called Peckle, okay? Peckle is a $20 game where you basically shoot a ball and you watch it bounce around and you try to beat the other player. This is a $20 casual game. My husband and I have taken this game and perverted it into a blood sport because that's how much of it we have played. I've probably played three or 4,000 hours of Peckle in the last five years. When you're watching someone do anything at a high level of skill, whether that's hit a baseball, you know, play in a fighting game, play Peckle, it's exciting like it's a spectator sport like i think humans just enjoy watching people do things well at a high so, level and if i could say this you know one of the reasons i think um i've never really been able to get into sports is because you know with respect women can't play football women can't play baseball you know the thing that makes games so beautiful is this is a, a place where women can get in there and compete just like men can. Right, so I right. think it's a really, it brings us all together. It's kind of like golf. That's why people like golf, right? Yeah. Because you can watch golf, and, and if you've got the money and the time, you can actually go play the same hole Absolutely. that the pros played. Well, you can't do that in football. You can't right. go run around and, and get beat up on, on a professional football game. That's interesting. So, so let's flip kind of to the negative side of things sure. for people that don't get it. And you just said you spent lots and lots of hours on, on this game. Sure. What do you say to people that say, ah, my kids are wasting so much time on these games, you know? Is it, is it okay? Is there, is there benefits? Is it, is it just because we've become so kind of wealthy as a society that we can afford the time? Or yeah. is it just purely a time substitution for what we used to do with yeah. watching TV or yeah. doing some of these other things? You know, I, I am not a parent, you know? Um, and I often wonder how I would handle having a child that was as addicted to video games as I am, you know? Um, what's very funny to me is all the time I spent uh, as a child, like playing Final Fantasy Tactics instead of going to class. Um, you know, given my profession these days, that was a good call. Yeah, it worked out all but right. that's not that's <laughs> not what most people should do. Um, I think it's really hard. Um, you know, I think that I think it can be a waste of time. And you know, I would love to sit here today and tell you that the science shows that playing games has no effect on children, but it doesn't show that. Um, so what happens scientifically is if your children play a lot of online games 
scientifically is it it slows their empathy development meaning they're gonna have a harder time relating to people thinking about them talking to them and sadly it's also going to stunt their social skills now, that doesn't mean you don't develop them later but it does have those negative consequences so i think that's something i would encourage parents to think about yeah well it's just it's just interesting right because you you've they've got the device right. so whether they're playing game they're on snapchat they're on instagram they're listening to music, they're Absolutely. watching YouTube videos. What's, up, what's interesting is it's all on the same device. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, homework and sports teams, yep. schedules, and, and this and that. Right. So, so you look at down the road, five years from now, what are we going to be talking about from gaming? So I think it's really interesting. If you look historically at any kind of computing technology, the mainframe era of technology, you know, Grace Hopper's era, basically, um, you know, that lasted about 20 years. The PC age lasted about 20 years. And, you know, we are about to cross the line into eight years of this. I don't think we're going to be touched, you know, tapping on class forever. Um, so my eye is more towards the future. Um, I think what is going to happen slowly is I think VR and AR are kind of being, they're going to be an interstitial step to us getting to neural interface, which is, you know, we're doing a lot of um, advanced things on that. So I think what's going to happen is Oculus is going to come out and Microsoft HoloLens is going to come out. And it's going to segment the market somewhat. Um, it's not going to dominate it. We're going to have games and programs and flat screen for a long time. But I think you're going to see people continue to pull out of the real world and spend more time in VR and AR. And I think that's kind of scary, but you know, there's no stopping it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because why? What, what, what do you need fingers and eyes if you can just go straight in, right? It's really Remove true. the middleman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, well, thank you very much, Brianna, for stopping yeah, by. This Our is first great. gaming representative here at the conference at uh, Grace Hopper. I hope I'm not the last. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I'm yeah, sure you yeah. won't be. So uh, great to see you. And again, thank thanks you. for stopping thank by. You. I'm Jeff Frick. We're at the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing 2015 in Houston, Texas. We'll be back with our next segment after this short break.